had a questions coming in from across the country and uh, if you've not submitted a question yet it is not too late you can still comment below and it will take some time to answer those got a little bit, bit of a delay so it uh, will take uh, about 30 seconds sometimes even as much as a minute for your question to get to me here uh, on this end but I will do my best again to answer as many questions as possible and uh, we are slated to hang out uh, tonight until uh, until about uh, 8 o'clock to spend time together, but we can certainly spend a little longer than that. I want to make sure I get through some of the key contact, uh, key content tonight in that time frame to honor your time. But if uh, you have additional questions, I will hang out a little bit later so that we can go ahead and uh, have that discussion together and uh, continue the discussion through the evening. So let's first of all I'll start. First of all, thank you so much for joining me this evening. My name is Jeff Veely, and I'm a youth motivational speaker, um, a bullying prevention specialist, and I've worked with at-risk youth for about a decade now. And this TV show, 13 Reasons Why, has caused quite a lot of buzz and even quite a lot of controversy in my office over the past several weeks since it launched. Uh, lots of phone calls coming in, lots of emails, lots of folks going to our website and, and saying, hey, what, how do we talk to kids about this? And so I want to take some time to address that with you as parents, educators, mental health professionals, uh, any sort of youth workers out there. I know there's a lot of different folks uh that are tuning in tonight. I've had grandparents emailing me and calling me about this. And so I want to take some time to address your questions tonight. Many of you have addressed uh, or sent in questions ahead of tonight's broadcast. If not, and you still want to ask a question, you can simply comment here on Facebook. Uh, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it will still take, uh, it takes a few a uh, few seconds for that to get to me here. About We have about a 30-second delay this evening, but I am happy to answer those questions. So another thing, before we really uh, kick off tonight, I want to let you know that if uh, you are under the age of 18, uh, tonight is really more of a conversation for mom and dad. I will be uh, sharing some discussion materials uh, for students later on. So if you're a student, you can just put your name below and uh, know that I'll be posting a link later, some information for you. Uh, but tonight we're going to have a very mature discussion on what is a mature topic and talking about some adult content. And uh, one of the problems I think that a lot of people have had with the show is that it's been a, uh, sharing a lot of mature content with young people. So right away I want to say if you're joining us tonight and you're under the age of 18, hey, I love you. I'm glad that you want to be with us, but I'm going to ask you to sign off. But leave your name in, a, in the comments below and I will actually send something to you later on that will really help you and encourage you as it relates to this topic. But uh, tonight's really for mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, and such. So thanks for tuning in. We're going to go ahead and uh, kick off. In case you have not uh, seen 13 Reasons Why, I know there's some folks that emailed me and said, hey Jeff, I didn't watch this series. Can you give kind of a, a brief synopsis as you get going? And if you've not seen 13 Reasons Why, what it is is it's a story, uh, a Netflix original series. It was actually produced, uh, one of the executive producers was Selena Gomez. And it's about the topic of suicide. Now, it covers a lot of different topics, uh, bullying, sexual assault, um, rape to be specific, drug use, alcohol use, uh, cutting. It goes through all of these different things, uh, even school violence, such as school shootings and stuff. It touches a little bit on that. And 13 Reasons Why really follows the story of Hannah Baker, who is a 17-year-old um, in high school, and it follows her story of committing suicide. As the show starts, we find out that uh, Hannah has died, and he's, she's left 13 cassette tapes in the care of Clay Jensen, who's really kind of the main character that we follow throughout the entire series, because, once again, this was filmed after Hannah had already passed. And on these 13 cassette tapes, Hannah narrates her story and the 13 reasons why she killed herself and the 13 people that in her mind caused her to do it. And uh, it follows all of this. And so as Clay listens through his headphones each and every day to these 13 cassette tapes, he learned why his dear friend and, spoiler alert, even his crush, Hannah Baker, killed herself. And as the series goes on, we see Clay get more and more disturbed as he learns the realities going on in Hannah's life, what she was dealing with, and perhaps what he could have done to make a difference. So that's kind of what this story is about. And there have been so many different reactions about 13 Reasons Why. There's folks saying, oh my word, this show is amazing. Um, I'm so glad that it's bringing up the conversation and the topic of suicide and addressing it in the way that it is. Uh, most amazing thing on television. 
There's other folks that are saying, hey, you know what, I understand what they were trying to do, uh, but the way they handled this was completely inappropriate. Tonight I want to look at kind of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, I'll let you know kind of where I land and uh, how you may feel as a parent, educator, or mental health professional. If you care about kids and you're watching, uh, I will say right off the bat that I do believe that you have some reasons to be concerned about this series. You might say, well, Jeff, why? Well, this series uh, kind of broke all of the rules when it comes to the media's, uh, the suggestions for media to report on suicide. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, um, I'm a media guy. I have a daily radio show. I reach, uh, <laughs> reach 70,000 people in my hometown with that daily radio show. I also have a, a national radio broadcast that goes out with some weekly radio features that I use to empower parents. I'm a media guy, okay? And there's certain rules, uh, or not even rules, but certain guidelines that the media is supposed to follow when we report any sort of act of violence, especially the area of suicide. In other words, mental health organizations, they've put together um, a series of guidelines and recommendations for how the media should report suicide. Um, and, it, and there's a reason why. And that's because that there's been numerous research studies that show that when suicide is reported incorrectly or irresponsibly in the media, it can actually cause the rate to increase. There's a group called Freakonomics, and they did a uh, study over many of years and they were actually able to prove that every time a suicide story is published in the media, whether that be a magazine, whether that be the evening news, whether that be a movie, whether that be a news article on the local paper, every time a suicide story is shared in the media, the rate goes up. I want you to just sit with that for a second. Every time a suicide story is published in the media, the rate increases. There's years of study, years of evidence, years of research to show this. doesn't matter the medium, whether it's a newspaper article, whether it's the evening news. Every time that that story is shared, the rate goes up. Why? I want to share, you, share with you my theory on that a little bit. The vast majority of young people, this comes from a renowned world therapist, James Lehman. He says, the vast majority of suicides are not caused by depression. The vast majority, about 80%, he says, are caused by lack of coping skills. In other words, people don't feel like they had any other option. They didn't know how to cope. They didn't know how to deal with the stress. They didn't know how to deal with the hurt. They didn't know how to deal with the anger, the sadness. They didn't know how to deal with themselves emotionally. So they chose what they believe was the only way out. They said, the only way out is for me to die. I mentioned to you I was a uh, that I work in the media, and I have um, for several years, for about five years now, but I've also worked in the mental health field. Um, I've worked for a decade now uh, with at-risk teens, and since I was 18 years old, literally, I have sat knees to knees with young people that uh, have been victimized in one way or another, abused or neglected. 80% of the kids in my caseload when I was working in the social work field, 80% of the kids I worked with had been sexually abused. I've dealt with a lot of kids, a lot of adolescents that have been suicidal over the years. In fact, several hundred. I've sat knees to knees with them. I've had conversations about how they're feeling and where they're at. So part of me is the media guy. I get that piece. But part of me is the guy who's been sitting knees to knees with that risk youth for a decade. The other uh, part of me, I'll tell you, and, and, and why uh, I am so passionate about this topic is because as a teen, I was suicidal. In fact, uh, just prior to sitting knees to knees with kids uh, a year or so before, I was sitting in a hospitalization unit and I was explaining to a social worker myself that I was suicidal, that I didn't have a reason to live. I went through abuse in my home, emotional and physical abuse growing up. I lost my dad in a tragic accident at age 16. And so I know what it's like to be a young person that's really lost, that doesn't know how to cope, and who can't see a way out of their situation. And so that's why I really empathize with uh, not only the character of Hannah Baker, but why I empathize with these kids that I've sat knees to knees with for the last 10 years. Because I know what it's like to be there. I uh, thank you guys so much again for joining. If you're just tuning in, I know we just have some folks. And Maria, thank you for the shout out. Glad you're with us tonight. Thank you for joining. Um, as we continue to dive in deeper, I'm going to be kind of interspersing your questions that you've submitted 
throughout the entire broadcast tonight. And we'll be uh, together live here for another uh, 15 minutes, kind of as I go through some of the core content, and then we'll be going from there. So let's uh, dive right into your questions. Um, we've got, uh, this is, uh, let's see, our first question here comes from Anna from New Jersey. She says, is Hannah Baker alive at the end of the series? We read on Facebook that she is. Well, uh, Anna, or Anna or Anna, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to say your, your name there. You're from Freehold, New Jersey. Thanks for commenting tonight. Uh, Anna, it, I will say that uh, Hannah Baker, as it plays through the series, she, she is dead when the series starts, but it kind of does flashbacks. The whole series is flashbacks to when she was alive. And so, no, she's not alive at all during the series, but it does so show scenes from when she was alive. And a little fun fact, if you are watching the series... The um, the actual lighting changes. So when Hannah, after Hannah dies, you'll notice that all the scenes and all the colors are darker, little cinematic effect. And when she's alive, in the scenes that she's alive, you'll see that the lighting is brighter. Just a subtle thing that Netflix did um, in producing that. Now, if you are a parent, uh, an educator, I want to let you let you know if you've not seen the series, you might say, Jeff, if my kids have watched this, what have they seen? And I want to be very blunt, I want to be very transparent with you of what your kids have seen. Um, they've seen some pretty foul things um, in this series. This is rated mature. We've had a lot of middle schoolers and high schoolers watching the show. I've heard of even elementary kids that have been tuning in. Uh, one mom said, hey, how do I talk to, to my 11-year-old about this? I caught her watching it, and I realized we need to have a conversation. I don't know what to say. We'll talk about how to process this with your kids in a second. But what have your kids seen? If they've watched 13 Reasons Why on Netflix, not only have they seen some, heard some foul language, that was kind of the tip of the iceberg, um, they've seen two scenes where two young ladies have been brutally raped. That's seen in the series. The actual act of Hannah committing suicide was shown in the series. And, and once again, if, if you're... If you're younger than 18, this uh, broadcast tonight is really for mom and dad. I'd love to talk to you at a later time. You can throw a comment below, but I'd ask you to just uh, tune into something else other than the broadcast this evening. Um, you know, watching this, like I said, I've sat knees to knees with kids that are suicidal. 80% of the kids that I've worked with in the social work field have been sexually assaulted. I've heard some pretty crazy stuff. I've heard some pretty wild stories. Um, I've walked with kids through some very serious and difficult trauma that makes you sick to your stomach when you hear about. And as a result of doing that work for 10 years, you sort of become desensitized to some of it, where I can have these difficult conversations and the look on my face doesn't change. I'm just right there with a the kid focused. Watching this series, for myself, even all the experiences that I've had, Watching those two girls get brutally raped on TV, I wanted to shut it off. It was extremely disturbing to me. I'm an adult. I'm a mature adult. I'm emotionally healthy. I'm mentally healthy. I'm, I'm in a good spot. So you can imagine for a kid that is younger, for anyone really under 18, or I would even argue older than 18, anyone that's mentally disturbed, to watch some of the things in this show, in this series, is extremely difficult and disturbing. In fact, if you have a young person that's on the edge a little bit, this can sometimes be a tipping point because they start to obsess on what they've seen on television. And that's why parents, educators, and especially mental health professionals are concerned about this series. So if your kids have watched it, you need to know that they've been exposed to drug use, alcohol abuse. They've seen two graphic scenes of sexual assault, and they've seen a teen commit suicide right before their eyes on this series. And I just want to let you know as mom and dad, if you've not watched this, that's what your kids have seen. And uh, if you have questions about that, you can comment below here in the feed tonight. Happy to answer those. Uh, but I want, to, want you to be aware. Um, I've got um, Amy here from uh, South Haven. And she says, you know, do the, do the pros outweigh the cons of, of, of triggering these behaviors? My kid watching the series, should I have a conversation? Absolutely, Amy, you should have a conversation. We've got Sherry here from South Haven as well. And she says, um, how do I deal with young people where this is triggering behaviors? Well, you need to get them professional, um, professional help from a counselor, uh, talk to a school social worker. I'm not sure if you're a parent or who you are uh, contacting me, but, but that, uh, that's what you need to do. Missy uh, from Kansas says, 
Jeff, I'm concerned, have there been any copycat attempts since the airing of this show? Um, I will say there have been no, okay, I will say there's been suicides reported in my office. I've gotten more, um, more calls reporting suicides in school districts in the last two weeks than I've had in the last three years. And it breaks my heart. It's actually the toughest part of my job. People, I, I work as a motivational speaker, so most people when they go to my website, uh, when they see me live, they think, oh, his job has to be awesome. He just goes from city to city and pumps up kids. And that's the cool part of my job, yes. The most difficult part of my job is the emails and the phone calls that come in when it's too late. And they say, Jeff, can you help this family? I'm a prevention guy. I will keep you in my thoughts and prayers. I will send words of encouragement. I will direct you to grief counseling. But at that point, there's not anything I can do for that kid. So my mission is to equip students with the social and emotional skills that empower them to face adversity, grow in resilience, and solve their own social problems. That's my mission. And I use resilience education for bullying prevention to do it. Have there been any copycat incidents? I don't have anything on record, but I did have this note that came in from Alyssa. And Alyssa, you said that I could share your name. I don't want to share your city, just to protect your identity, but you encouraged me to share your story. So I'm going to do that. Alyssa says this. She says, Jeff, I'm currently 25. About a decade ago when I was a teen, I struggled with suicidal thoughts. Thank God I didn't attempt or cause any long-term harm. I've been good since I was 17 when I came to Christ. I still struggle with minor depression due to other health issues, but it's nothing overwhelming. Watching the show, Jeff, was a trigger for me. My depression got much worse. Thank God I'm a balanced adult, but I can't imagine what this show is doing to teens who are struggling like I did. My personal opinion is that this show shouldn't be watched by anyone. There are other ways to be informed about teenage life and supposed lessons it teaches parents. Now, I want to be just, just frank with you. As a parent... It's really your choice whether or not you allow your kids to watch this. Um, I'm not going to condemn you if you have your kids watch this. Uh, I believe that's your choice as a parent. I will say that I believe that if your kids are under the age of 17, they shouldn't be watching it. Uh, the rating suggests, suggests that and um, for the series, and, and I'm going to say so as well. A lot of times what we see is with TV series, we see this with products and advertising all the time, we'll see a company develops a product to reach a specific age group. In other words, that product is designed to reach that age group to attract their attention and to hold their attention. And then they put a label on it to say, hey, this isn't appropriate for the actual age that we developed it for. I don't want to bash Netflix, but I believe that that's what they did here. It's extremely engaging for a middle schooler to watch this series. It's extremely engaging for a high schooler. I even think elementary kids would be drawn in by the story. But now we've slapped a label on it, oh, you should be 17 and up. They know that there's kids younger than that watching this. Um, and that's not a good thing. So have there been any copycat incidents? Um, I've gotten several emails that there have been students that have watched a series modeling some of the behaviors in their school districts. Now, I'm not here to speculate and say any of the suicides reported in my office have been a cause of this. It is your personal decision. It's a choice that you make if you decide to end your life. A TV show can't make that choice for you. Mom and dad can't make that choice for you. The person who bullied you can't make that choice for you. But whether it's people, whether it's media, all of those things can influence you. And that's why we need to look out and make sure that there are good influences. All right. Connie says our community has had 17 students 17 suicides since last August and many more adults. We are a wounded community asking why. This series is causing conflict with many of us. Should or shouldn't we allow our teens to watch? A local expert is saying that it will be planting suicidal ideas into the heads of youth that are already hurting. I'm hoping that you will address or enlighten how to handle this with our youth that are thrown into the paths of pain. Many teens have already watched this. I have a friend that noticed her 15-year-old son had been watching. She immediately reset Netflix. There's lots of concerns about this. 
So you're asking that. Um, Brian, uh, Brian, I actually know you, uh, Dr. Brian uh, from Rockford, uh, Michigan. Thank you. He says, are schools wiser to address this topic in a public way, such as in assembly um, or in classrooms, such as health or Bible? He uh, is the superintendent of a Christian school. Uh, Brian, I'm going to share this with you, and I'm actually going to post this in the comments a second, and I'm just going to kind of share... First of all, I think it's your personal choice whether you let your kids watch this or not. If you think your kid is at risk at all, then my answer is no. You should not let them watch this. The only time I think you as a parent, once again, this is my personal opinion, take it for what it's worth, <laughs> I think you should only let your kids watch this if, number one, they're 17 or older, number two, if you're watching it with them, Number three, if you are having ongoing discussions with them about it. And number four, um, if you first ask, ask yourself and verified first that your kid is not at risk at all or on the fence. I want to go back to that, uh, that uh, and what I'm posting here on the wall a second so you can see. I just uh, commented on the broadcast here. I just posted my program's actual policy and how we handle um, suicide. I don't talk about suicide in school assemblies, and I think this will answer these last two questions when I tell you why. Why don't I talk about suicide in school assemblies? When I sp speak to thousands of young people a year, I've spoken to over a million people on the issue of bullying up until this date. Why don't I talk about suicide from a platform? My answer is simple. I don't want kids to choose suicide. Why give them an outcome that I don't want them to choose? And you might say, well, Jeff... But kids need to talk about it. I totally agree. But here's my belief. I believe that when we talk about suicide, we should have those conversations in small groups where we know who's around our circle and we've had a way to sort of identify or check where they're at emotionally, mentally. I believe that we should start there. I think that we should have suicide conversations in one-on-one -on -one conversations so that I can constantly know where you're at so that I can use your response to help me uh, say what I'm going to say, cue me what I should say next. If I go out on the stage and I speak to sometimes audiences of 1,500 teens in some larger high schools, middle schools, if I'm speaking to 1,500 young people and I'm just generally talking about suicide, I could have five kids in that audience. I could have 10 kids in that audience of 1,500 that were thinking about killing themselves. And since it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and since maybe they were rushed to class after the assembly, they don't come talk to me about where they're at. And as a speaker, as a mental health professional, I'm responsible for that information that I, that I give out. I don't want a kid to... I, 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 in other words, I want a small environment where I can personally check in with everybody before they walk out of my classroom. Because I need to know that they're okay. I need to know where they're at. I need to be able to see their faces, their eyes, their, their body language when we start talking about this. I never, ever address suicide in a, in a large assembly. And so, uh, Dr. Brian, I hope that answers your question. Um, and the reason why is because I can't check in with that person. I need to know where everybody's at. If we've got a kid that's on the fence, the last thing I want to do is have something that I say, a story that I tell trigger in them. Uh, the idea that, well, maybe this is the choice for me. We handle that in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And uh, when I go to schools, uh, anyone that has talked to me and had that conversation is referred to a counselor. Um, we're getting close to 8 o'clock here. So uh, first of all, I want to let you know if, if you uh, need more resources on this, you can go to uh, jeffveely.com. I'm going to put a comment below. I'm going to stay and uh, answer some more questions here, but I want to cover just a few more things. Uh, I'm also going to paste below here just so you have it. If you want to visit my website, you can look at that in the comments. I'm also putting a link here on uh, recommendations for journalists, recommendations for the media on how you should report suicide. Once again, 13 reasons why, uh, although it was named Forbes' number one series of the year, um, it broke all the rules when it comes to reporting suicide in the media, and that's why we're concerned about it. Again, renowned a therapist, world-renowned therapist James Lehman says that um, 
less than 20% of suicides are actually caused by depression. The vast majority are caused by um, a lack of coping skills. So you as a parent, you might say, Jeff, should I totally freak out if my kids have seen this? No, don't freak out. I want you to understand it's never too late to have a conversation with your kids about this. But it's important that we show our kids another way. I want to uh, honor your time. I'm going to end with kind of my general content here right at 8 o'clock or just maybe a minute or two after. Um, and then I'll stay on to ask questions, uh, answer questions that you may have after this. I met a young lady a few years ago. And my job was to privately coach her. She was being bullied at school. And this story is important. And for the sake of this example, protecting her identity, I'm going to say her name was Abby. I sat down with Abby and I said, Abby, tell me what's going on at school. She started to tell me of the bullying that was taking place. And she says, Mr. Jeff, there's nothing that you can teach me that I haven't tried. I said, well, okay. She says, what do you think you're going to teach me? She says, I have tried everything. And she says, at this point, I don't have any choice. She says, I'm just going to have to kill myself. I said, what did you say? She said, I've tried everything I can think of to make it stop. I'm going to have to kill myself. Now, I deal with kids that are suicidal every day. So I'm very familiar with that. The fact that she was suicidal was alarming, but that's not what scared me the most. The thing that scared me the most were the words, have to. I said, what in the world would make a 13-year-old girl believe that she has to commit suicide, that she has no other way out? So I was bold and I asked her, I said, why do you believe that you have to? She said, Mr. Jeff, don't you watch TV? She goes, every day there's a teenager on the news and they commit suicide because there's no other way to make it stop. Don't you get it? It's online. It lives forever. There's nothing you can do. She goes, it won't stop. Nothing that I try will make it stop. She says, the only choice I have is to kill myself. And she started bawling her eyes out, sitting on the seat next to me. Thankfully, I was able to show Abby another way out. In fact, she's doing great. I've been able to keep in touch with her over the years. She's doing fantastic. She was being hospitalized for suicide. She was in hospitalization two weeks before we had that conversation. Her parents were afraid that she was headed back. I taught her social skills and emotional coping skills. When I taught her those two things, she was able to find peace in her life. The best thing you can do with a young person that is at risk, that's on the fence, that doesn't know what to do, is to teach them how to respond, to empower them. Once again, my mission is to equip students with these social and emotional skills that empower them to face adversity, grow in resilience, and solve their own social problems. Because when you teach a young person skills, social skills, emotional coping skills, when you teach them how to no longer be a victim in their life, they can find peace. You can't change the world around the victim. You can't control other people's actions, but what you can do is teach them how to control the reaction. Boost their empowerment, and when you see that happen, you'll see their self-worth goes up, their self-esteem goes up, their self-confidence goes up, they find peace. And so that's the best thing you can do. Uh, everybody that signed up for the broadcast uh, at, uh, on my website, you uh, will have a, a chance to get some coping skills, some, some things that you can use with your kids sent out. I want to post something uh, here on the wall as well, if it'll let me post an image. I don't think it's going to let me post an image. I will uh, email that to you. There is uh, the American Suicide uh, Association. They actually came up with something called uh, 13 Reasons Why Not. And it's uh, 13 ways to stand up and not give up. And that's what we need to do. So here's what I want to do. It's 8.03. I'm going to wrap up here in the next minute. What I want to tell you is my challenge to you is I want to flip the script. And here's where I want your help. I want to flip the script on this suicide conversation. I'm going to stay on for a few minutes here and answer your questions. But I want to flip the script. How do you want to flip the script, Jeff, you might be wondering? Instead of telling suicide stories, what if we told resilient stories? Instead of talking about people that have given up, what if we told young people inspiring stories of people that have made it? People like Nick Vujicic, who lives his life with no arms and no legs. What if we told him that? He, he doesn't let it stop him. He fishes. He goes surfing. What about people like Lizzie Velasquez that at 17 years old went on YouTube, she was surfing, and found a headline with her picture that said, the ugliest girl in the world. 
She didn't kill herself. She didn't give up. Instead, she went on to being one of the most successful motivational speakers in our country today. Her TEDx talk has ha had over a million views, and she's an amazing voice, empowering voice, especially for young ladies in the areas of beauty, self-esteem, and self-worth. What if we shared these stories with our young people? I want us to do that. This next fall, I'm going on tour. I'll be taking my uh, bullying prevention tour. And uh, in case you want more information, I'm going to put a link here uh, in, the, uh, in the description. It's called the Love Changes It All Tour. April, I see your question. I'm going to get to you in just a second. lovechangesitalltour.com and put that link there. You can visit that if you're interested in more about the tour. Um, but I'm going to be going and I'm going to be sharing a workshop called Resilience Revolution. And the entire presentation is me countering culture and sharing people that have gone through difficult circumstances but they've overcome. They've made it. And I believe when we share those kind of stories with our young people, that's what encourages them. That's what inspires them. That's what motivates them to overcome obstacles and they say, oh my word, if that person did it, maybe I can too. I'm Jeff Feely. Thank you so much for tuning in. I want to invite you, uh, I'm going to be sending out some materials uh, related to this broadcast as well as a, a recording of tonight as long as all the technology worked here in studio. I'll share that with you. That'll be going out via email. And uh, if you've not signed up for my email list yet, uh, tonight you can do that at Free Bully Solutions. Dot com. Again, freebullysolutions.com. I'll send you a free video training on how to bully-proof your kid within 10 minutes and uh, teach you some great stuff as well as the resources from tonight. So thanks so much for tuning in. I'm going to stay in, stay on for a few minutes and answer some of these questions that have come up in the comments. My buddy Chris Schoof from Texas, he says, Kids tell other kids, uh, Chris was just uh, actually voted as Teacher of the Year. So Chris, uh, congrats, bro. Doing awesome work in Texas. He says, kids tell other kids to go kill themselves all the time. It's become a normal, regular insult. Totally true. It's become a regular joke as well. Go kill yourself is a regular thing. As a teacher, it's disturbing to hear that thrown around so nonchalantly. I told a kid the other day, just because someone tells you to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. And that's where things are difficult. I totally agree, Chris. And young people are impressionable, and so they're more likely to act on things. One of the problems with 13 Reasons Why is it was sort of a revenge fantasy, right? Uh, the Catherine, who, who played uh, Hannah Baker, Hannah Baker in the series, she makes these 13 tapes to say, look, you're the reason why I killed myself. You're the reason why I did this. And so that's what these 13 tapes are about, is her saying, pointing the finger and saying, these 13 people are the reason why I killed myself. Well, they may have negatively influenced you. They have may picked on you and picked on you. You should have never been treated that way. But ultimately, who made the choice to kill Hannah Baker? It was Hannah Baker. I will say uh, one of the big concerns about the show too is the uh, social worker or the school counselor, excuse me, in the show, um, Mr. Porter was not supportive. He did not recognize the signs that Hannah was suicidal. There were some very clear signs, or some very clear things that she said. And rather than reporting that, and uh, you're welcome, Chris, rather than reporting that and following up on that, he just kind of let it go. Um, and so he was even involved in a lawsuit with the school district, and, and that's, that's the deal. Tiffany said, I would love those coping skills. I did not sign up on your website. She tuned in last minute. Good for you, Tiffany. Thanks for joining us, girl. Uh, go to freebullysolutions.com or jeffveely.com. You can scroll on the page there. There's a spot to enter your name and email. Put your name and email there. I'll make sure it gets to you. I will send you those coping skills and all the resources. Cool. Uh, I want to go back to my sheet of questions. If I haven't answered your question yet, lo siento. That means I'm sorry in Spanish. All right, Lisa, Muncie, Indiana. She says, as a school counselor in the middle school, I often get reports of students calling each other's names, spreading rumors, and making fun of each other. Mostly, I don't believe this behavior is bullying. I usually have the mindset that it's back and forth, so it's not bullying. Can you go over the definition? Super fast. Easy definition of bullying is dominance behavior. Simply one person trying to have power over another. And they do that by trying to hurt your feelings, trying to make you upset. If you get upset, you lose and they win. There's three parts of the triangle that uh, three things, criteria that have to be in place in order for behavior to be considered bullying. Number one, there has to be an imbalance of power. Person doesn't necessarily have to be bigger than you, but they just have power over you. They assert that in some way. 
So there has to be an imbalance of power. That person has to get pleasure from inflicting pain. And once again, these people aren't sociopaths necessarily. <laughs> Less than 2% of society are sociopaths. In other words, when people dominate, when you have power over somebody, it feels good. It's like that King of the Mountain game we played as kids. I don't know where you're from, but I'm from Michigan. We get high snow banks. When we at recess would climb up on the top of the snow bank, and you were the king of the mountain. If you could push all the other kids off and stay up there, you're like the supreme being. You know, you're like the dude, right? And so that was the whole goal of King of the Mountain is to push people other off and stay up there. These people aren't sociopaths. When I say they get pleasure from inflicting pain, it simply means they enjoy dominating and being on top. So it has to be an imbalance of power. That person has to get pleasure from inflicting pain, and the behavior has to be repeated over time. A lot of times kids will run up to me in the hallway while I'm working at a school, and they'll say, he's bullying me. I'll say, well, what did he say? He said that my dad voted for the wrong person for president, and I don't like him, and da da da. He said that this video game's stupid. And I was like, okay, how long has this been going on? Well, he just said it twice. Okay, well, that's not a pattern of behavior that's repeated over time, and that's not bullying. That's called a disagreement. Yeah, the kid probably enjoys seeing you get upset because you're freaking out in front of me, but that's not bullying. It's not a pattern of behavior. If you want to learn more, Lisa, uh, Lisa from Muncie, Indiana, if you want to learn more about the definition of bullying and how to make it stop in 10 minutes, go to freebullysolutions.com. Totally free training. I unload my brain for 30 minutes on the best way to make it stop, including the peace sign approach to bullying. I'm getting a little like special at this point in the broadcast. I've been talking for over five hours straight today. <laughs> Lovely. And I've had a cookie, so I apologize. Uh, Jay from Coral Springs, Florida says, I think the movie did a great job raising awareness of suicide and depression, exactly what's going on around us. Why are parents concerned that this, is, uh, this movie is bad and something that's promoting suicide? Especially when we allow our children to play violent games that promote gun violence and watch movies that are not of age. Well, the reason why this is a concern, Jay, is because uh, 13 Reasons Why Netflix, they broke all of the rules when it comes to reporting suicide in media. And as a result, um, it, it's causing some problems. We have young people that are now, since they're impressionable and they've been influenced by the show, they're repeating behavior that they've seen on TV. Just like when your kid watches a superhero movie, right? They come out of the theater and they want to go home and they want, they want you to buy them a cape for Halloween or they want a cape for Christmas or for the birthday. They take the bed sheet off the bed and they put it on. They've seen it on TV and they want to reenact it. A lot of kids do that. Um, it becomes this fantasy in their mind. And whether it's positive or whether it's negative, they start to reenact that behavior. Kelly from uh, Milford, Pennsylvania says, Why is it that suicide has the appearance of being more contagious than other behaviors? We don't seem so much concerned or outraged over kids watching a movie and fearing that they will act on homicide They'll act on vandalism, binge drinking, or positive behavior. Suicide, however, seems to carry with it this idea that if we talk about it, young impression of people will act on it by virtue of the word being uttered. Is the taboo nature of suicide that carries with it this fear of it becoming contagious? Um, should you have conversations with your kids about suicide? Well, I don't want to give you a definite, definite answer on that. I think it depends on the age of your kid. It depends on how emotionally mature your kid is, uh, mentally stable, all of those things. So I, 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 that's not a one-size-fits-all answer, and so I want to be careful as I answer your question. I think that at some point we need to talk about the idea of suicide with, with our kids uh, because if you, know, you as a parent, regardless of how important you feel the media is, all the research and studies show that parents are still the number one influencer of teens. And so, um, yes, it's important that you talk with your kids about these things. If they don't hear about it from you, they're going to seek answers from other sources, such as media, such as friends who probably don't know much more about the topic than they do. You do need to have discussions. Um, and I'll say with 13 Reasons Why, it's something that's become part of our culture. It's become so popular. It's, it's especially part of youth culture, part of pop culture right now. And just like with any tragedy or trauma, I mean, we see the shooting at Sandy Hook. You see Columbine. We see 9-11. We see movies that come out about other issues. Um, your kid may hear about a movie about aliens, like E.T. came out or some I mean, other, other recent movies about aliens. And if you have a kid that's impressionable, they might be thinking like, oh my gosh, are there really aliens? Is someone going to abduct me in the middle of the night? Like, there's all these different things that become part of our culture, and we can either ignore them and pretend they don't exist, completely shelter our kids, 
Or we can go the opposite side of that spectrum, is the way I think of it as a spectrum, and talk way too much about it to where it's oversaturated. You have to find where that spot is for you and your family. I think that anyone that has middle school age kids or teens, my recommendation, once again, is my opinion, I would talk with your kids about it. It's part of their culture right now. I can guarantee kids are talking about it at school. I can guarantee they're reading about it online if they're on social media, if they're watching the evening news, if they're watching TV at all, they're hearing about it. And so, yes, you definitely want to have those conversations um, about the show, but also about suicide at some point, I believe. Um, but the biggest thing is you want to let your child know if you ever feel hopeless, if you ever feel like there's no way to solve a problem, you need to remember that suicide is a permanent solution to what's often a temporary problem. Feelings, circumstances change. You can even share a story from your family's life. Maybe you had, maybe you had a grandma pass away. I was a freshman in high school. I had my grandma passed away, and I thought it was the end of the world, and I didn't know what to do. But several years later, going through something difficult, someone could point out to me, say, hey, do you remember when your grandma passed away? And you thought you would never get through it, but you made it. You figured out how to overcome. What I tell young people is often you find your potential in a moment of pain. It's not ideal. It's not fun to live through. But you find your potential. You figure out what you're really made of. You find your true strength. And you can use that to overcome things in your life. And even share with other people as they overcome things in their life. You can uh, use that to inspire them. Okay, let's see here. Is there anyone live right now? I still want to go back to these questions. Let me come back here to our feed. I'm watching it on a TV monitor. If you have a question right now that you'd like me to address while well, I'm right here, please comment and you're with us now. I know not, ever, not everyone is still with us. Okay, April, let me go to your question. What if you have a child in almost the same situation? How do we help deal with the bullying? Do you help mentor in the Zealand area? April, great question. Um, I have a uh, coaching program for young people where uh, we stop bullying and one week guaranteed. You're like, Jeff, that sounds crazy. Well, we've won two international awards for our approach at helping young people solve social conflict, specifically bullying. And so I guarantee that uh, kids that use my peace sign approach for one week, that the bullying will stop. And uh, our success rate is 95%, so it's pretty good. By the way, a success rate for an anti-bullying program, according to the anti-bullying industry, if you have a 20% reduction of bullying in schools, they call that a success. I call that an 80% failure. Our kids deserve better. Um, our kids really deserve better. So yes, um, I actually live in West Michigan. I think you're talking about Zealand, Michigan. So I live in West Michigan. I travel all over the country doing this work. Um, but uh, I live in West Michigan. I'm absolutely available to mentor. Um, kids, and so uh, private uh, private message me, April. I see your comment here on the wall. Private message me, and I'll respond with the details for that. You can learn more at jeffveely.com. Uh, that link is there on the feed as well. Um, what do you do if you have a child in almost the same situation? First of all, I want you, April, to go to freebullysolutions.com. I want you to enter your name and email. I'm going to send you a 30-minute training. It's totally free on how to bully-proof your child with the peace sign approach in 10 minutes. Um, also, I'm happy to coach your child privately. Um, it's extremely affordable. Um, our treatment program is uh, $197, uh, extremely affordable. Uh, most uh, kids uh, actually go to, to therapy for months and months. We're able to help them stop it within a week. Once again, that's guaranteed with our program or your money back. Uh, we do a professional assessment, actually two assessments with all the kids that come through our program, and then on the front end, the back end, to show how they've grown and resilient. So anyways, more information on that, jefffeely.com. You can also private message me. Andrea and Sarah, I see your comments. I'm going to get to those in just a second. Chris, Mr. Shoof, he says, what do you expect from season two? Um, spoiler alert. What do I expect from season two? Uh, season one ended with a character named Tyler, who's a school photographer, packing... Um, what looked like an AK-47 and there were assault rifles in a trunk as well as some other explosives. I believe that season two, which it, yes, it, it's confirmed, uh, 13 reasons why it was confirmed by uh, executive producer Selena Gomez. They are coming back for a second, series, second season on Netflix. 13 more episodes to follow Hannah Baker and other characters. I believe that that um, series will open with a mass school shooting um, the size of Columbine High School. 
the rumors and the research I've done online, um, that was one of the cliffhangers at the end of season one, that uh, we're likely going to see Tyler um, initiate a school shooting. Again, I have concerns about this because young people like to model what they see in the media. Dylan, uh, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, who uh, were the shooters in the Columbine shooting back in 1999. I'm very familiar with the uh, shooting. I know the Scott family, the uh, parents of Rachel Joy Scott, first student that was uh, killed in the uh, Columbine shooting. I worked on a movie of, of Rachel Joy Scott's life, was involved with that production. Um, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris first started uh, doing shootings in video games. That's where they got this. And they say that um, some of the research on why violent video games can incite violence in young people or why there can be an increase in violent behavior from young people that are playing violent video games, a lot of that research either comes from uh, studies of Eric and Dylan, some of their journals and stuff that they left, or research studies that were launched after Columbine in 1999. That was also the birth of the anti-bullying movement. So I think there's going to be a massive school shooting. I also think we're going to see the um, impact of trauma on the main character, Clay, who is Hannah's, I guess you could say, probably best friend in the series, and also her crush. I think that we're going to see more of that. And I also think we're going to see other behaviors unfold, such as Bryce Walker in the series. Uh, he, uh, it was reported, there was evidence turned in that he raped Hannah Baker, as well as Jessica Davis, another character in the series, and those two brutal rapes are shown on TV. Again, very disturbing for young people to watch. I believe that it's probably going to show the trial and what happens to him after that as a result of those acts. So that's what I'm expecting from season two. And uh, once again, a lot of concerns about what it's like for young people to watch that and what kind of copycat behavior we'll see, as there already has been copycat behavior documented from season one. In other words, kids are starting to act out things they've seen in the series at school. It's causing a lot of problems. I get, I'm getting a lot of emails from school counselors, principals, and parents. This is what they're seeing. Sarah, how can we address students that use the phrase kill yourself often and or say, I'm going to kill myself? Is it, it is thrown around too much? Absolutely. If a kid says they're going to kill themselves, you need to take that serious. People say that for two reasons, I believe. Number one, and this is once again a decade working with youth, my opinion, but I've always found that kids say that for one reason. I'm going to kill myself. They're either saying that because they truly are going to kill themselves, and that's a warning sign to let you know, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Number two, they're saying it to get attention. I find that the kids that are saying it just to get attention, if I give them the full attention of what it looks like to really mean that, in other words, I send them to the counseling office, I call mom and dad, they have to meet with people. They might get certain privileges restricted at home. If they're saying that just to get attention, they realize they don't want the attention that that attracts. That's one of my strategies. If they're saying it because they really need help, well, then I've still taken all the right steps. So my advice to you is no matter what kids, uh, no matter what the motive might be behind saying that, if a kid says, hey, I'm going to kill myself, take that seriously and follow up as if they were serious on that. Now, if you know it's becoming a joke and it's gone on for a while, I would sit down and have a conversation and say, you know what? What you're saying is really serious, and I need to know whether or not you're serious about this because I really care about you and I'm really concerned. And I will tell you, 10 years of sitting down and having these conversations with kids, those that are class clowns, when they see the compassion in my eyes and they say me leaning, see me leaning and having that conversation, they usually say, Mr. Jeff, I, I didn't really mean it. I say, well, are you sure? Because if you have ever felt that way, if you're feeling that way now, there is help available for you. I care about you, and we're not going to leave here and, and, until I make sure that you're okay. And then that kid is usually pretty honest with me. Make sure you're having those conversations. Mr. Porter, the school counselor, and 13 Reasons Why, he didn't pick up on the signs with Hannah. He, uh, he missed a lot. He wasn't a very good uh, example of a school counselor, quite honestly. He was horrible. Uh, but it happens. Educators, mental health professionals, parents, we miss this. Uh, studies show that people that commit suicide, people that die by suicide, let me change my language there, people that die by suicide, they believe that's the only way out, have typically told at least one person that they didn't want to live anymore or going to kill themselves. So when we hear someone say that we need to take it seriously... If it's becoming nonchalant, if it's becoming the culture to say that at school, these kids 
aren't seeking help, and we know they're joking around, we know it's, we're throwing it out there, what they're doing is they're reinforcing the stigma of kids that are struggling with this issue. That behavior needs to be addressed. I believe that it needs to be punished. And we need to have some very serious conversation because that could trigger a kid next to them in the lunchroom, next to them in the classroom, next to them in the hallway that really is on the edge, and we're just not going to take that chance. If you're serious about it, we're going to get you help. We will do everything we can. If you think you're being funny, I wouldn't overreact. I wouldn't get upset because that's probably the reaction they're going for, for from you. But you need to figure out how to make that behavior stop. And sometimes that's setting some very clear boundaries and following through on some consequences. It's not a joke. And the more we make it sound like a joke, the more that person feels like... I remember kids making jokes at school about killing themselves right after my dad died. Um, I remember kids making jokes about suicide at school when I was being abused at home and I was feeling suicidal. And what does that do to you when you're a kid who feels suicidal? It weighs you down. Oh my gosh, it's horrible. Um, Andrea says, oh, what specific signs do you think Mr. Porter missed in the last episode? Gigi, I'm going to get to your question in just a second. Andrea, uh, what did he miss? Um, I, I, she says, as a school counselor, I realized he didn't know much about her situation except what she was telling him in that moment, which wasn't much. She said a key line, which was, I don't remember exactly, I can't quote her perfectly, but it was either, I don't want to live anymore, or I don't see a reason to live anymore. She gave some very clear indication that she had lost all hope. That was his big cue of, I need to go deeper. The other thing is her body language, she was visibly upset, and she abruptly tried to end the conversation several times. That's a sign of a student, first of all, that didn't trust the adult she was talking to. But second of all, um, that's a sign of a student who is emotionally disturbed in some way and is uncomfortable with the conversation. What he would have been better to do at that point, what I would have been if I was in Mr. Short Porter's shoes, what I would have done, is recognized, okay, the student is not comfortable talking with me. We're talking about sexual assault, which is what she talked about in the last episode. For me to talk with a young lady about sexual assault, I mean, I've done this many times over the years, 80% of my client base had been sexually abused. We've had these conversations. If I realize that that kid's uncomfortable, I say, hey, you know what? I'm going to have you talk to counselor so-and-so over here. I think woman to woman, this is going to be a better conversation. It's going to be an easier conversation for you. In other words, you don't end the conversation. You don't allow them to quit the conversation. You simply transfer it to someone else that they might trust more than yourself. And you handhold until they're with that other adult. Um, so I think that's what he missed. Gigi, thanks for commenting. I'm a school counselor, as you just mentioned. Mentioned, Sorry. Ugh. There's been a huge increase in students that are resorting to having thoughts of suicide. And of course, I always take it seriously, as you just mentioned, but it's every week. Is there something we can do in the school to prevent this from happening? Prevent the ones that are doing it possibly for attention. Um, yes, Gigi, what should you be doing? You should, be, uh, have, you should have a social and emotional learning program in your school. Uh, Gigi, I want you to actually go ahead and comment what city and state you're in. Um, because if I'm in your area on my tour this fall, I'd love to come to your school. So, for example, my program, that's the one I'm most familiar with, so that's what I'll tell you about. We're a social emotional learning program. And my goal, my mission, is to equip students with these social and emotional skills that empower them to face adversity, grow in resilience, and solve their own social problems. Miami, Florida. Okay, we actually do have a Florida tour coming up. I think it's next winter, so private message me and I'll give you the details. Um, but what we do is uh, I go in and I teach kids social skills. So when someone's bullying you, when someone's mean to you, when you're dealing with difficulty in life, how do you interact with that person being mean to you, number one? And number two, I teach emotional coping skills. How do you deal with the stressors? How do you deal with the frustrations? How do you deal with the hurt emotionally to protect your heart and so that you can overcome? What do you do? How do you respond so that you can be okay? I teach these coping skills. Once again, I don't address suicide in a full school assembly because I don't know where those kids are emotionally at. And if something I say on stage triggers somebody and I can't physically see that body reaction, if, if I say something that disturbs somebody and they're going to do something or it's going to cause a problem, I can typically tell in their body language. Once again, I've been doing this for 10 years. You show me a kid for two minutes, you show me their body their, their physical cues, I can pick up on it like that. I'm just trained to do that. Um, 
If you haven't for a long time, it might take you a little while. You're, you're a school counselor. You probably could pick up on some of that stuff, of course. But um, I would say hold, hold a program that teaches coping skills. In other words, teach coping skills. Let's take instead of there's prevention, right, Just trying to prevent the problem on the front end. There's intervention, getting involved when the problem's occurring, and there's response. Crap, crisis just happened. We need to come in on the backside. The idea is to always take care of the problem and educate young people in the prevention side. Now, if you get to intervention, obviously you can still address it there. Response, you talk about what went wrong and how to do it differently the next time. The problem when we talk about the issue of suicide is we can deal with prevention. We can find a young person who's having suicidal thoughts and intervene. But response, the kid has died at that point a lot of times. You know what I mean? So the response is at that point helping the school community grieve after there's been a suicide. Um, one of the recommendations as far as uh, media and as far as for schools is you have to be really careful the way you memorial memorialize someone that has died by suicide. Why? Well, if I, so let's say, I'm going to use myself as an, an example. In, in school, I didn't feel like a lot of people noticed me for a while. I didn't stand out. If I stood out, I thought I stood out for all the wrong reasons. So one thing that I wanted was for kids to pay attention to me. Now, if I see one of my classmates, one of my peers commit suicide, and there's a big memorial, and everybody's writing on the poster, everybody's leaving a card, they're leaving flowers and all of that. Now, yes, it's part of the grieving process, which is healthy. When there's a death, a significant death in life, we need to grieve. That's healthy. That's, that's positive for our mental and emotional health. We need to do that. But when I walk out and say, oh my word, this person is getting more attention now that they passed than when they were alive. For some young people that say, well, I wonder if people would pay more attention to me if I killed myself or if I harmed myself. Maybe I need to do something negative to get people to pay attention to me. So that's, that's a danger zone there. So the best thing you can do to prevent suicide in your school, implement a social and emotional learning program that teaches um, coping skills and social skills. If you're interested about my program coming to your area, once again, you could scroll down here in the comment, lovechangesitalltour.com. If you have more questions on this, uh, private message me on my page here. I'd be happy to uh, talk to you more about that. Uh, Nashville Public Schools, they implemented so, uh, social and emotional learning programming exclusively. They saw an 11% increase in their test scores in one year. They implement social and emotional learning programming Test scores boost by boop, 11%. The district was ecstatic. It's amazing. We find that the biggest distraction to education and academics is social and emotional drama. Kids that don't know how to deal with their peers in communication, they don't know how to communicate when there's conflict, and they don't know how to emotionally cope with internal conflict or even outward conflict that they're processing internally. So when we equip them with social skills and emotional coping skills, they're no longer victimized. They no longer feel helpless. They know how to start to solve that problem and get better, and that's what really makes a difference. Lori says, uh, oops, sorry, Chris, I missed you, bro. Uh, he says, share the difference between how Hannah was bullied versus what behaviors against her were actually crimes. There are too many people lumping it all into bullying. Yeah. So let me be real with you. I hate the word bullying. It's confusing. The word bullying was invented in 1560. It's a Middle Dutch word that originally meant friend or loved one. This is crazy. <laughs> it originally meant friend or loved one. Today it means person that wants to ruin your life and make you kill yourself by being mean to you. If you thesaurus the word bully, you'll find it next to jerk, punk, meanie, like all of these horrible words. Bullying is simply dominance behavior. Now, where is the difference between bullying and legal behavior? So, uh, Chris, Chris wants me to address this, and he talks about bullying as a speaker like me. Um, and, and a very dear friend. So the line, uh, bullying is any, uh, any behavior that causes subjective harm. Okay, It can be verbal insults. It can be cyberbullying, which is simply verbal bullying that happens online. It can be pushing and shoving. Um, it can be uh, rumors. It can be jokes. It can be threats. Anything that causes subjective harm. It's not a crime. It's not illegal. It's permitted under freedom of speech by the Constitution. You're actually protected you can be disrespectful, disrespectful legally. You can bully someone. You can pick on them. It's legal here in the United States. Now, yes, I know there's laws for this and that, but good luck when someone calls you an idiot, taking them to court, or if they cuss you out and you try to sue them for emotional damage. 
the likelihood that you're going to get any money out of that or that person is going to get any jail time is slim to none. What, what is the legal side? Well, the legal side is anything that causes objective harm. I'm talking about vandalism, destruction of property, stealing, uh, physical assault, assault and battery. These are all crimes. That's where the difference is between bullying. Bullying is not illegal. It's not against the law. It's not a crime. We talk about stealing. We talk about vandalism. We talk. No, notice how those are all specific words. We need to get rid of this word bullying. That's why I talk about dominance behavior. That's when a young person comes up to me and says, Mr. Jeff, I'm being bullied. And I say, okay, wait a minute. That means a lot of things to a lot of different people. What specifically is someone doing? Well, they're calling me names. Okay, I know how to help you solve that problem. What is someone specifically doing? Oh, they're spreading rumors. Okay, I know how to help you solve that problem. I don't know. I mean, I, I've talked to... I've talked to over a million people a year. When a kid tells me, or a million people so far on this topic, not a year, that'd be awesome. Uh, yes, God, I'll take it. I'll talk to that many kids, please. <laughs> when, uh, when a young person comes to me and says, hey, Jeff, I'm being bullied, I have to clarify, what do you mean? Well, someone said my lunch block box was stupid. Okay, do you believe it? Well, no. Okay, well, then what's the problem? And it's, it's done. We've squashed the social squabble. Obviously, a lot of times it's more serious than that, but there's just an example. So I even have to ask those clarifying questions. We need to use clear language. The word bully, everyone's lumping all these behaviors and all these ideas of what they think it is. I ask school counselors all the time, hey, we're having a problem with bullying. Okay, w define bullying. They can't correctly define it. I ask parents, define bullying. They can't correctly define it. I've asked psychologists, what is bullying? They can't, they can't cite the definition. And they're leading seminars on it. It's ridiculous. Why? Because the media has blown this up, and we've tried to add all of these different definitions into what bullying really isn't. Let's use clear language. It really simplifies things. So Lori says, I'm currently working on my internship for school counseling, and also work as in a counseling center in Mount Calm County in Michigan, not far from my house. I'm wondering if there would be any kind of summer training I could take part in over the summer. I teach in Grant, Michigan. Hey, I'm going to be in Grant, Michigan uh, next fall on tour, so uh, you should private message me, Lori. Um, first of all, you can go to freebullysolutions.com. There's a half hour of professional development training there, completely free to you. Again, freebullysolutions.com, Lori. Um, so you can check that out and enjoy it. Um, the other thing, I'm not sure if I'm doing any training in our area here over the summer. I'll have to check on that, but private private message me and we'll uh, we'll connect. Um, cool. I'm going to answer some of these other questions in an email, um, unless if you are still with us and you have a question you'd like me to answer specifically, feel free to comment. We've got a little delay, so I'm going to um, I'm going to read through this. What are the red flags or warning signs that your kid may be suicidal? Clarissa from Houston, uh, or excuse me, that's a Sarah from Clearwater, Florida asked that question. Uh, warning sides, uh, not wanting to participate in activities like normal, uh, a kid that always wants to go to bed early, a kid that wants to uh, skip school. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean warning signs for suicide. This could be bullying. This could be other stuff going on. But uh, it lets you know that your kid's at risk. Um, and quite frankly, as my mentor Josh Ship has said, uh, there's no such thing as at-risk kids. The fact is that all kids are now growing up in an at-risk culture. Everybody's at risk because of the world we live in. Uh, I would say that these are indicators that your kid is at high risk for bullying, suicide, something like that that's more serious that you want to look at. Other red flags, um, hiding, uh, hiding either their phone or their computer, trying to keep some sort of secret journal, any way they might be communicating, posting, writing something that they may not want you to see. Um, if they start to wear clothing that is either covering up their body in some way, in other words, they might be self-harming, such as cutting, they might uh, be wearing sunglasses because either they've been hurting themselves somewhere uh, near their eyes. I've seen kids do that where they've scratched themselves here. Um, I have seen uh, kids that will wear sunglasses or wear a hood because they're afraid that they're going to cry in front of others. Kids that get easily choked up. Um, other warning signs... Um, uh, kids that don't want to be home or kids that want to be home all the time. Any uh, thing that's a, a clear um, change in their normal behavior where you just see a real lack of motivation and a big swing in behavior, appetite can be another thing too. 
uh, that's when you really want to sit down and have some of those conversations. Okay, going back over here to our Facebook thing. You demand too, Chris. Love you, brother. Chris, I said this earlier, Chris just got voted as Teacher of the Year in Texas. If your kid has Mr. Schufel for a teacher, they're getting taught well. Dude is rocking it. Congrats, Mr. Teacher of the Year. All right. Uh, cool. How can we prevent students from glorifying suicide? This question comes from Amy in Crab Orchard, Nebraska. Amy, you can uh, prevent, well, you can't really prevent students from doing anything. You could try. You could try to influence them. You can't stop them. You can't control anybody else's actions. You can only control your reaction and how you influence them. Um, I would suggest uh, that you try to um, reduce the stigma. We talk about physical health, and everybody gets excited, right? Or people are like, oh, yeah, physical health. You should be healthy. You should work out. You should exercise. We talk about mental health, and everybody gets weird, like, mm. You gonna talk about like suicide and stuff? We need to reduce that stigma. I shared tonight a couple times during the broadcast. I was suicidal as a teen. Some people hear me say that and they're like, "You tell people that? You really tell people that?" Yeah, I don't stand on stage and tell kids that because I don't want them to choose that. But I let them know, hey, there's a point in my life where things were stacked up against me and I didn't know if I was gonna make it. Here's the skills that I used to make it. Here's why I'm standing here today. I tell them the positive side. So how do we prevent them from glorifying suicide? How can we influence their behavior? We, uh, we talk about how difficult it is to go through hard circumstances, and we share stories that inspire them to overcome. Uh, we share stories of people that have overcome difficult situations and made it. Uh, Susan from Westwood, New Jersey, how do you suggest addressing this issue with younger children? We have children as young as 11 relating to the program and demonstrating suicidal ideation and self-injury. Jeez. We want to be proactive without giving too much information. Susan, first of all, my reaction, if you're watching, uh, my geez, there a second ago, it's just I'm really sad to hear that. I'm really sad to hear that. It's reality. These, these young kids are watching this show, and that's where, that's where everybody's concerned. Um, you, you really have to look at where they're at. If they've been exposed to the show, you need to have those conversations. If they've only been exposed to a glimpse of it, I would suggest that they don't watch anymore. It's not appropriate for that age. Um, yeah, you just kind of got to meet them where they're at. And once again, talk about coping skills. Teach coping skills. That way, if you have a kid that's on the edge, uh, they have some skills of what they can do to, uh, to make it stop um, and to overcome that for themselves. So hope that gave you, gave you some great tips. Everyone that, uh, if you got an email from me today, let me say this as simply as, as possible. If you got an email me, from me today with a link to watch the broadcast, you will automatically get an email from me with a bunch of resources over the next few days related to tonight's broadcast. I'll also answer a few more questions. If you did not get an email from me today, if you didn't use an email from me to click a link and watch this broadcast that you're looking at now, then... You're not on my email list. So in other words, I need your email in order to send that to you. So if you did not get an email from me today, follow the link I'm putting in the comments right now. You're going to go to freebullysolutions.com. You're going to get some good stuff. I just put it in the comments, so you'll see it pop up there. And you can uh, please share this website, freebullysolutions.com. Please share that. It's 30 minutes of free training. The Peace Sign Approach, which are it's a two-time international award-winning approach. We're recognized by the United Nations for it. Um, we teach you how to bully-proof your kid in as little as 10 minutes. And uh, this is my secret sauce. 30 minutes of it, I give it to you for free. Because I want you to go help a kid like me when I was in middle and high school. That's the reason why I do this. Um, so go ahead and do that. So go over to freebullysolution.com. Not only will you get that free training, but that will put you on my email list so that I can see that you want the resources that uh, follow tonight's broadcast. All right, last chance if you're just tuning in for questions. Last chance for me to answer your question. Otherwise, I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> Been a lot of talking. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, I know I went late, but we've had, a, we just, we've had hundreds of questions pour in for this broadcast tonight. I knew I wouldn't be able to address them all, but I wanted to give a good overview um, here, as many as I could. Wait just a few seconds because I know we've got a 30 second delay. Um, so if you have any last minute questions, feel free to enter them here. I'm watching the feed and I'll take your question. 
don't want to leave any question unanswered for those that are still joining me live. Thank you for watching tonight. Um, due to the nature of uh, the content tonight, I am going to be deleting this from my Facebook feed. We talked about some mature content. Um, I don't want youngsters that might be on Facebook even though they're not supposed to. Yes, Gigi, you can private message me through Facebook. You can also email me. My email is jeff at jeffveely.com. Jeff at jeffveely.com. Either way you want to contact me, I'll get in touch with you. So I'm going to be deleting this video, but if you're on the email list, I'll send you a copy of it. As long as all the technology worked here, hopefully we got our technological ducks in a row, uh, I'll send that to you, and that way you have this, this broadcast. You can refer back to, you can forward it to, if you're a school counselor, principal, you can send that on to coworkers, mental health professional. Cool beans, thank you guys so much uh, for joining me tonight. I would like, uh, if you would just do this for me, could you put um, could you put a comment of what was most helpful about the broadcast in the comments here? Will you do that? Because I want to highlight that in the materials that I'm emailing out. So please just put in the comments here what was most helpful. Something that you learned tonight, something that was helpful, something that you want to pass on to young people. Again, I'm going to be following up with email with everybody. And the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to be launching this tour for next fall where I'm doing a program called Resilience Revolution. Uh, where I'm going to share essentially 13 reasons why not. In other words, if you have a school and you're trying to figure out how to address this, I would love to come to your school. I would love to talk with young people, not about suicide, because I don't talk about that with the masses, but I will definitely sit knees to knees with anyone that needs to talk about that. And I will definitely teach them coping skills so that we can prevent this from happening in your district. I will definitely share with them resilient stories that inspire them. I'll talk to them about people that wanted to give up and they overcame because sharing those stories is what helps encourage us. So thank you so much for commenting on what you learned tonight and uh, for uh, sharing your stories with me, asking questions. Thank you. I just uh, I really appreciate it. I'm really encouraged for everybody that, uh, that in, uh, joined tonight. So thank you so much. Love you guys. Peace. Take care.